Hey YouTube, how's it going? Yak Science here with another OCHEM video. Today we're moving into new territory. We're going to talk about elimination reactions. Uh, previously we talked about substitution, SN1, SN2. Now we're going to be talking about elimination, E1 and E2. This video we're just going to do E1. Next video is going to be E2, okay? First I want to go over uh, the basic mechanism for E1. So first, first thing that happens in any E1 reaction, leaving group leaves. This will happen completely on its own uh, in the presence of heat, just like in SN1, right? Leaving group leaves. Step two, this, meaning the, the leaving group leaving, forms a carbocation. And remember, carbocations are really unstable, so this will be the rate determining step. Both of these, you know, they're basically the same thing. This is the rate determining step. It's, it's high activation energy because it's very hard to form this. It's very unstable, very energetically unfavorable. Okay, so you have a carbocation, but now in SN1, we would have the nucleophile attack at the carbocation site. Here, instead, a base will deprotonate a hydrogen, deprotonate an adjacent hydrogen. What we're going to see all of this as an example in a bit. Don't worry if it sounds kind of foreign right now. Base will be protonate an adjacent hydrogen, meaning adjacent to the carbocation. And form a carbon-carbon pi bond, a carbon-carbon double bond. Okay, this holds true for all E1 mechanisms. So that's a good thing to know. The, there are complications, of course, um, but it's really good to start with this. Okay? So now I want to start with an example that I'll show you a case, where actually most cases, where you can have SN1 products and E1 products. So here we go. We're going to react it with methanol. And in the presence of heat, right? We need heat. Uh, for the rate determining step. So first things first, bromine leaves. Okay. So what does that do for us? I'm going to redraw that in this confirmation. It just looks better. Same thing. Carbocation at that position. Now let's just, for the hell of it, go through the SN1 process. What would happen based on what we learned in the last video. Normally, methanol would just attack the carbocation site. We would get something like this. Um, this would be a positive formal charge. We would get another methanol to deprotonate it. And then all is good. We would end up with something that looks like this. Right? That would be the SN1 product. Now I want to show you that in this exact same situation, without changing any conditions, we can get an E1 product. So for E1, remember, first step is exactly the same as SN1, leaving group leaves. We now have a carbocation. But now, instead of having uh, methanol attack the carbocation site, let's take a look at adjacent hydrogens. Adjacent hydrogens are the key to all um, elimination reactions, whether you're de dealing with E1 or E2. So here are all of our options. In this case, they all have to happen to be equivalent options. It doesn't matter which one we take just because of the symmetry. You'll understand that later, I promise. So let's bring in our, now let's not call it a nucleophile, let's call it a base. So we'll bring in our base, very weak base, but it's a base. Deprotonate any of these hydrogens right here. Move those electrons to form a carbon-carbon pi bond. And now go straight up to uh, the product. What, what it's going to end up looking like is this. Just like that. All the carbons are happy. And uh, instead of having the nucleophile attached, our product simply contains a new carbon-carbon pi bond. Uh, so that's that. Uh, some properties of E1 that I just want to go over real quick. 
Like I said, we need heat for the same reason as SN1, right? The rate determining step, having the leading group leave and forming a carbocation requires a lot of heat. That's a huge activation energy barrier for that step, so we need that extra boost from the heat. Good leaving group, obviously you need that for SN1, SN2, E1, and E2, because if the thing doesn't want to leave, then you're not going to have a reaction. So, good leaving group. Stability of the carbocation, definitely important, because carbocations want to be stable, for sure. They're unstable uh, by nature, so the more stable the carbocation, the faster the reaction will take place. Uh, you need a base. Weak bases are okay, so for the purposes of E1 and for the purposes of the class that you're in, pretty much anything with a lone pair uh, can act as a base for E1. That won't hold true for E2, but with E1 you luck out. So pretty much any alcohol, any uh, you know, amine, anything like that uh, can act as a, a good enough base. And remember, you need the base because you're deprotonating a hydrogen. Finally, you need polar protic solvent, same reason as for SN1. You want to stabilize that carbocation, and in a protic solvent, uh, you can have hydrogen bonds to stabilize that positive charge. Okay, now one last thing. This is probably the most important rule for understanding elimination in general, E1 and E2, and that is Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev's rule. So there, there are multiple ways to state the rule. I, I personally like this, this version. Uh, the more substituted alkene, sorry my handwriting is kind of atrocious, um, the more substituted alkene is favored. What do we mean by that? Well, what does the word substituted mean? Let's talk about that. An alkene, right, a carbon-carbon double bond within a molecule, can either be mono-substituted, it would look like that, right? This would be mono-substituted, because it only has one R group, one carbon group off of the alkene. The rest are hidden hydrogens, or maybe, you know, OH or whatever, but they're not carbon groups. So there's only one carbon group um, coming off the alkene, okay? Let's just put that, make that hydrogen just for simplicity. We'll keep it consistent. For di-substituted, you have uh, two R groups coming off of the alkene, right? They could be there and there, they could be there and there, there and there, it doesn't matter. In this case, this is a trans diene, not diene, I'm sorry. A di-substituted trans alkene. Um, furthermore, you're probably ahead of the game, but tri-substituted would look something like this, right? Three carbon groups coming off the alkene. And finally, tetra substituted would have four uh, groups, four R groups coming off an alkene, okay? Mono, di, tri, and tetra substituted. Zaitsev's rule tells us that when we're considering the mechanism, uh, we have to take into account what we could do in order to ensure that we get the most substituted alkene. Tetra being the best, mono being the least favored. So we're going to see an example of that right now. Okay. So I have an example prepared. Okay, by the way, this is OTS. It's, it's shorthand for tosylate, which is a, a hyperconjugated leaving group, extremely good leaving group, probably the best leaving group you'll ever encounter in your OCHEM course. So uh, very useful to know. Okay, let's pretend we didn't learn Zaitsev's rule, which is kind of a bad thing for me to say, considering I just taught it. But let's pretend that we, we never learned it. And let's solve this, let's uh, write a reaction mechanism pretending we didn't know what Zaitsev's rule was. You'll see why I'm doing this in a sec. Let's react this with some ETOH, eth uh, ethanol, and heat. So if we were to do just a regular E1 mechanism based on what I told you before learning Zaitsev's rule, we'd probably solve it like this. We'd, we'd say, okay, OTS leaves, and now we have a carbocation right here, and then look for adjacent hydrogens. There's none here because this is a quaternary carbon, so our only available hydrogens to pluck off to deprotonate are these. And so us not knowing Zaitsev's rule would go ahead and draw our methanol, ethanol, excuse me, 
grab one of these hydrogens, send this over into a carbon, uh, to form a carbon-carbon pi bond, and then up to our answer, just like this. Now, this is, is this a mono-substituted, di-substituted, tri-substituted? It's mono-substituted, right? This is mono-substituted. Will this occur in nature? Yeah, it will. But is this the major product? Definitely not. I'm going to show you two other products that are better than this. There's going to be a di-substituted product and a quaternary, sorry, uh, tetra-substituted uh, product that we can form. So I'm going to prove that to you right now. So now we're going to pretend, not pretend, we're going to go back to Zaitsev's rule, which we already learned, and we're going to apply that now. So we approach this problem, we're in the middle of a test, right, and we see this. The first thing you have to think to yourself when you know you're dealing with elimination is what can I do to maximize uh, the substitution of the alkene in the end? So there's a lot of thinking ahead. But here, here's, here's the way it's going to work. If we take one of these methyl groups and do what we love more than anything in this world, which is carbocation rearrangement, right? Greatest thing ever. Um, what you do is you shift the carbocation from this position to that position. You see that? So now here's where we are. Right? I redrew that methyl over there and tosylate is now gone. Our carbocation is now in this position. So what, what are our options for hydrogens? We could pluck this hydrogen right here. There's one. You have to look for adjacent hydrogens. You can't pluck the hydrogen that's on the carbocation. Uh, there is none in this space, but you know what I mean. We have these hydrogens, and then we have these hydrogens. These are all our options. So thinking ahead, because thinking ahead is really key for elimination. If we were to pluck one of these hydrogens, we'd end up forming a carbon-carbon bond, uh, a carbon-carbon double bond right here. See that? Along this line. And that would give us a di-substituted product, because you'd have one, two R groups. If we were to pluck one of these hydrogens and form that carbon-carbon double bond right there, we would again have a di-substituted, one, two R groups. Now what if we plug this hydrogen right here? Let's see. You probably guessed it. Right? Move this into a carbon-carbon double bond and take a look at our beautiful, extraordinary product. The picture-perfect example of a tetra-substituted uh, alkene. So, looking back uh, to the very first thing that I did with the mono substituted, now you can see that there are many, many more options, or two more options, um, <laughs> for, for the product. So tetra is favored, di substituted is also favored over mono, but this would be the major product. On a test, they often ask you for the major product, so this would be the only answer. Okay? So always look for, for uh, how you could rearrange the molecule so that you could plan ahead for the most substituted product. Okay? So that's E1 in a nutshell. Uh, I might do another video on a bunch of problems. We'll see if I have time. But I really hope that uh, you gain something from that. Thanks for watching.